Hey, welcome everyone. This is Matt Modritzer with SOCMA. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to give it another minute or two here. Just let a few more attendees join and then we'll get going. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Yes, hello. Hey, uh, sorry about that. Everybody should actually be muted. Um, oh. <laughs> but uh, hey, thank you for joining us nonetheless. <laughs> well, thank we you. Are, Thanks uh, for having us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll try, we'll get that tour down and we're going to get going in just a minute here. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, everyone, uh, welcome again. Uh, thank you for joining us today. This is Matt Modritzer with SOCMA. Um, and we were planning on, uh, or we were hoping to have everybody's lines muted except for myself and Jim DeLisi. So uh, we're currently working on getting that fixed. But um, in the meantime, if you, wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind putting your lines on mute, we're getting a little noise in the background. Okay. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. This is Matt Modritzer, Manager of Legal and Government Relations with the Society of Chemical Manufacturers and Affiliates. And today, I, along with Jim DeLisi, will be hosting a uh, presentation on navigating U.S.-China tariffs and what specialty chemical manufacturers need to know. Before we get going here, just a few housekeeping matters. First is that this webinar is being recorded, and there's going to be an uh, email link going out to all registrants after the webinar where you will be able to access a recording in the slides, so look out for that. Second, we will be governing this webinar with Sockland's antitrust policy. You shouldn't really need to worry about that as long as the lines are muted since we'll be monitoring the questions through the webinar's chat function, but nevertheless needs to be saved for the record. Third is a disclaimer, while we are confident in this information and believe it to be true and accurate, uh, the material in this the material and information contained in this webinar is for general information purposes only. Uh, we hope to cover a good amount of information within the hour, and so therefore, please reach out to SOCMA and further consult us or industry ex experts to confirm this accuracy and understanding before relying upon the material or information in the presentation as a basis for making any business, legal, or other decisions. Regarding questions, we'll leave time at the end for your questions, and then Jim DeLisi. President of Fanwood Chemical and Chairman of SOCMA's International Trade Committee will be on hand to answer questions. So at any time during the presentation, you can type your questions into the Q&A chat function, and then Jim will read those questions over the phone so that everyone can hear questions and answers. So uh, for those of you who do not know me, again, my name is Matt Modritzer. I'm an attorney licensed in Colorado, D.C., in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and I manage legal and government relations matters at SOCMA related to, related to global trade, environmental and health and safety policy in the specialty and fine chemical industry. I also manage SOCMA's International Trade Committee where we focus on a broad range of issues including customs, trade, and trade remedy law and policy, and of course tariffs. Joining me today is Jim DeLisi, president of Fanwood Chemical Inc. Jim has been a part of Fanwood Chemical since joining his father Vince DeLisi in the business in 1976. Jim remains remains very active in several associations. He's the chairman of the 
Industry Trade Advisory Committee for Chemicals, Pharmaceuticals, Health Science Products and Services, also known as ITAC-3. This committee reports to the Secretary of Commerce and the United States Trade Representative on international trade policy. A longtime member of SACMA, Jim also serves as the chairman of SACMA's International Trade Committee. Jim holds a BA in business from Rutgers College and a PCMBA uh, from Fairleigh Dickinson University. Married with two grown daughters and six grandchildren, Jim resides in Scotts Plain, New Jersey. So I just want to give a little background on Section 301 and how we got here today. So looking at some language from the statute, in essence, Section 301 uh, allows the president, usually through the U.S. Trade Representative, to take whatever action he or she deems necessary to remedy unfair trade practices. Uh, it's interpreted quite broadly and was originally passed to help initiate government-to-government -government consultations. It was most notably used in the 1980s to get uh, U.S. manufacturers better access to foreign markets. So with what we're seeing now, uh, there's not too much precedent on the statute use in this manner. This time, the U.S. has accused China of using unfair trade practices and industrial policies to hurt the U.S. economy, such as forced technology transfer and discriminatory licensing of American firms in exchange for market access in China. Government, government facilitated technology acquisitions overseas and cyber intrusion of trade secrets. So before this New investigation by the Trump administration. The U.S. had actually launched five Section 301 investigations against China. One of those was into barriers to market access in 91. Uh, three were over IP rights from 91 to 96. And more recently, one into China's clean energy policy in 2010. Um, and as most of you know, China entered the World Trade Organization in 2001. So no sanctions were put in place and agreements were reached to diffuse the tensions. China actually revised its IP rules, stepped up IP prote protection, removed the state subsidy for domestic green energy companies, and further opened market access to the U.S. Um, so going back even further, from 76 to 89, the U.S. used Section 301 against the Japanese. Uh, friction began in the late 1950s and peaked then in the late 1980s when Japan, when Japan surpassed the Soviet Union as the world's second largest economy in 1987. So as Japan's trade surplus with the U.S. increased steadily during that period, U.S. and Japan had frictions across a wide variety of sectors, steel cars, textiles, semiconductors, things like that. And in fact, the U.S. launched more than 20 investigations under Section 301 against uh, Japanese manufacturing sectors and uh, also curbed Japan's exports with anti-dumping measures. So what's important here is that Section 301 worked against the Japanese. It forced Japan to make concessions like opening its domestic market, reducing exports to the U.S., and improving domestic law and enforcement issues on things like IP protection and the treatment of foreign investment. So now the administration is using a similar approach that USTR and Lighthizer used against Japan when uh, U.S. Trade Rep Lighthizer was actually Deputy Trade Representative back in the Reagan administration. The difference today, though, is that in economic scale, China today is much stronger than Japan was in the 1980s. Japan was in a far weaker position because of its economic reliance on exports generally and the U.S. market particularly. China's exports currently contribute only one-fifth to its GDP, um, and its exports to the U.S. account for less than 20 percent of China's total exports in 2017, half that of Japan's during its peak period. So, What's the point of all this? The point is that China is less likely to abandon its political model and retreat from these industrial policy goals. Um, and the economies are strong right now, so Beijing and Washington can afford to stand firm for the foreseeable future. Uh, lastly, on this side, I just wanted to note here that many specialty chemical sectors are obviously driven by IP, and while SOCMA supports the administration's efforts to address these longstanding issues with China, the combination of proposed list three tariffs, if implemented in the Chinese retaliatory tariffs, would likely be catastrophic. So uh, timeline of the investigation here, August 2017, USTR launches this investigation. So the investigation in the exe executive report predominantly focused on purported uh, forced technology transfer to joint venture affiliates and theft of IP, that same stuff. Uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, and the report, in fact, said that either the Chinese government is turning a blind eye to all this, what's going on, or in some cases is actively supporting these practices, 
and now it's quite problematic for U.S. manufacturers, including specialty and fine chemical manufacturers. So following that report, uh, in April 2018, a $50 billion list is published with info on the public comment process. And during this public comment process, SOCMA uh, testified and filed comments mostly concerned with pigment and pharmaceutical chemical intermediates. And we were actually successful in getting those intermediates delisted, uh, which was a great result, uh, all things considered. Then in the wake of those hearings, USCR published a revised list one on only $34 billion worth of Chinese goods. Various products were delisted, many being steel and aluminum, covered by the ongoing Section uh, 232 cases. But most importantly, again, pharma and pigment intermediates were, in fact, delisted per SOGMA's comments and testimony, which was a big win for the industry. After all, given the, uh, the purity and performance demands of these chemicals and lack of alternatives, alternatives to China, things like that, uh, the burden on the industry would often be disproportionate. So moving on to list two, list two targets many basic plastics as well as polyurethane, you know, one of the rare polymers that China exports to the U.S. in large quantities. And while staggering 40% of the originally proposed U.S. list two tar targets uh, chemicals and plastic, the impact on the specialty chemical industry from this list is it was actually pretty negligible. So SACMA didn't get much interest from members and didn't comment nor testify. SOCMA, we're much more concerned with list three. Nevertheless, companies should still check list two against products imported from China. Um, also unlike list one, list two, uh, which tariffs are currently being collected starting last week on the 23rd, it contains 279 of the original 284 tariff lines. So uh, essentially only five product lines were deleted from that list, which was a little disconcerting. Um, so that just goes to show that arguments to USTR need to be compelling here on list three. So I'll just briefly go over the list and the tariff lines and how that works. Um, so these lists cover products at a tariff line level, meaning all imported products fall somewhere within the harmonized tariff schedule and they have a harmonized tariff number. And so these lists include certain HTS numbers at the eight digit level. Products themselves are actually at the 10 digit level, meaning you just look at the first eight digits of your Chinese origin 10 digit products and to the extent that the product falls within that HTS and is manufactured in China, then it's captured by the list. So in July, list two is finalized, which came with a federal register notice citing, dis uh, citing disapproval of the Chinese government's retaliatory tariffs and their refusal to concede on the IP front. Um, and so USTR published a proposed list three, which again is what we're most concerned with today. And that currently covers uh, $200 billion in, in imports from China. So given that our, our 2017 total import value from China was roughly $505 billion, um, this is, you know, getting to be a big chunk of those imports. So getting to the proposed list three impact to the specialty chemical industry. List three impact is massive. Nearly all chemicals of Chinese origin are listed on this trans three um, in eight digit categories in HCS chapters 28, 29, 32, 38, and that's including uh, 38 OA. So the US Chamber recently estimated that if the administration were to extend its farmer aid package to other sectors, chemical manufacturers we need 960 million, and that was back when the list three rate was 10%. And this puts U.S. chemical manufacturers then as the second most affected sector behind U.S. auto and auto parts manufacturers, given the aid to farmers uh, who are obviously most impacted by the tariffs and retaliation in general. Nevertheless, though, third most impacted uh, is quite staggering. So Accordingly, we asked in testimony and we'll ask in comments that all eight-digit categories in these HCS chapters be delisted from Trump's three. Uh, we'll also go into details about specific subheadings and, and whether or not products are available outside China. So regarding the macroeconomics, you know, studies anticipate, say, a, a loss in half a point or G, in GDP or something like that. But the shift in market shares and profits is, is much larger than that net welfare loss. And for individual firms, it's, it's those changes in market share and profit that really matter. Regarding the last point here on SMEs, um, as probably everyone knows, specialty, chemi 
specialty chemistry brings uniquely manufactured substances to market often through uh, small batch production. Specialty chemical manufacturers thus face proportionally higher business costs as a segment within the chemical industry and face equivalent or potentially lower net revenues. Many such firms also concentrate operations around one or a relatively small number of facilities since the batch manufactured products they create are not afforded the benefits of scale that are enjoyed by bulk chemical manufacturers. So um, we're basically noting this and other instances of SME circumstances to USTR since USTR has explicitly requested information on impact to small and medium-sized companies. Uh, just briefly, I want to go over our testimony to the 301 committee uh, that we did the, uh, last week. So, um, specialty chemicals, as the name implies, obviously, especially made to meet particular purity, quality, and performance demands for a lot of different downstream industries. So, given these rigid quality standards, alternative sources are extremely finite. Uh, for most industry sectors, tariffs mean shipping sourcing which results in a rise in the price of imports, but for chemicals, this, this really isn't always possible. So this is similar to other industries, chemical manufacturing requires very costly and specialized infrastructure and expertise. Regulatory burdens and the need for significant capital investment also contribute to the inability to shift that production. So the speed or lack thereof by EPA and permanent pollution system approvals for for new sources of ingredients makes for a, a pretty slow process and in many cases is a non-starter. So also the, um, the highly regulated nature of this industry often requires uh, obviously changes in raw materials and, so, and suppliers receive prior approval from U.S. agencies and other world, regula other world regulators, for example, the FDA. The second point here um, regarding you know, the inputs that chemical manufacturers have to import to create their uh, products further down the value chain. Um, to illustrate this point, consider the miscellaneous tariff bill. This bipartisan legislation provides tariff relief to American companies, and since MCB is only applicable to materials that are not manufactured domestically or available in sufficient quantities, passage does not have a negative effect on domestic manufacturing. So as the MCB awaits passage in the House, chemicals make up over 1,000 of the roughly 1,800 petitions recommended by the US ITC for tariff relief. So this fact, I mean, the fact that over half of cleared MCB petitions are for chemicals really speaks volumes regarding the degree to which chemical intermediates are simply just not domestically available. And then the last point here, again, on SMEs. So exposure here is going to depend on the segments, which companies focus, obviously, and their ability to respond to changes in trade policy conditions. Companies with a larger global footprint may be advantaged while smaller companies have less reserves to draw on when times get tough and uh, less ability to deflect higher materials prices or pass those costs along to new customers. So then again, I, I'd just like to reiterate the small batch point that I made on the last slide. But in general, though, while we support the administration's goal to reach this zero tariff trade, imposing heavy taxation on Americans, uh, which is made worse by the retaliatory tariffs, is, not the proper method to achieve that aim. So we support resolutions for constructive and continued dialogue with China before this threatened protectionism creates further uncertainty and leads to countries reducing their dependence on U.S. made specialty and fine chemicals. So we'll get into the sectors here a little bit. Um, regarding agriculture, roughly 50% of imported agrochemicals are on list three. And uh, Jim DeLisi actually has this list. So if you are a SACMA, if you are a SACMA member looking for the ag specific list, uh, contact me after the webinar and we can get that to you. But at, between the U.S. list and the China retaliation, ag is going to take a hit here. So point two, pharmaceuticals. Um, this round less focus on finished drug products, but list three does cover an extensive list of raw materials, chemicals, and some active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, so the Proposed tariffs apply to a myriad of drug products, including some common drug, drugs like aspirin and insulin, and vaccines for human and uh, veterinary use. They also apply to a broad range of specialty and fine chemicals used as starting materials, and chemicals used in the prescription and over-the-counter drug manufacturing. So, major concerns there also. Moving on to performance, 
couple of sectors, for example, pigments, uh, pigment intermediates are again listed. And as our pigment members, manufacturer members know, uh, the sector requires particular chemical feedstocks not available in the US nor other countries outside of China. So by adding these tariffs, we'd be giving competitors, for example, in Europe, an advantage over domestically produced pigments where they'd be able to buy feedstocks from China at that lower cost uh, without the added tariff burden. And that enable them to import in the US and then essentially sell their pigments at a lower cost. So this is the sector subheading we're discussing in comments. And then lastly, uh, regarding rubber and lubricant additives, a significant portion of those items are on the list in chapters 29 and 38. But for more information on these various sectors, feel free to ask questions or follow up offline. So at this point, I just want to talk a little bit about how companies can petition for relief. And there are two different processes that, that can be pretty easily confused. So first, there's the process of removing HTS lines from the list. And then after that, if they're not delisted, there's a process of excluding particular products from the list. So the criteria for relief is somewhat similar, but the processes in, are not the same. Perhaps most notable is that they are accomplished by different procedural mechanisms. Um, so each list has been published. There's opportunity to comment and say, hey, please remove this line for X, Y, and Z policy reasons. Or alternatively, some people are actually asking that finished goods be added to the list, uh, which members have brought up, but SOCMA, along with most trade groups in general, can't really do that for a variety of reasons. Um, typically, that argument will go if the, if the raw material input is on the list, and finished goods should be on the list too. Otherwise, the incentive is going to be to move manufacturing to China other than away from it. So this is another one of those instance, instances where submission of individual comments would be more appropriate. Uh, but Stockman was successful in this first process with tranche one, and we're hoping for a similar result on tranche three. Um, on list two, the most recent round, there was Again, a substantial reluctance by the administration to take HTS lines off the list. So when this happens, uh, products are not delisted. There's also this exclusion process on a product-specific basis. Now, SOGMA members need not really worry about this for list one and two um, because the product's on that list, but we have every reason to think that the list three process will look similar to these other lists. So you can make a submission arguing that you know, you're unable to source this product from anywhere else and that this tariff will have a devastating impact on my bottom line and the company. So this particular product should be excluded from uh, the scope of these list three tariffs. So again, this uh, the list two process isn't out yet despite the list two tariffs being in effect and neither is the list three obviously since that is still being vetted. Uh, but we'll talk more about this in a bit. So I just wanted to give an overview of list time and impact here on one slide. So the initial 34 billion went into effect for import entries made on or after July 6th. For list two, uh, we have not yet set a deadline for the exclusion request. Last I checked that that e-docket is not currently open and we've been in contact with our contact, the USTR, trying to get that point across that, hey, you know, if, if these lists are implemented, that, that just needs to be open when these lists are in effect, essentially. Uh, regarding the product-specific exclusions to the extent that they are ultimately granted, uh, that exclusion is going to be re retroactive, but it's not perfectly clear yet um, when. Some say it'll be retroactive to the date when you filed. Others say um, it'll be on the effective date of the tariffs, but regardless, it will be retroactive, and that's important because it, it could take um, many months for these to get processed. and USTR is not robustly staffed for this, and ordinarily they would probably pull some staff from the Commerce Department to assist, but Commerce currently has their hands pretty full with steel and aluminum 232 exclusion requests. So we surmise exclusion requests will take a while. I'll also note here that list one exclusion process is, it's a pain in the neck, but we're working with other industry groups and trying to communicate this to USTR and ITC. So if they use this procedure for list three, it'll be pretty difficult to navigate, but we'll have more info on the list two process soon and whether anything has improved. 
regarding less three weekend don't have an effective date because comments are still coming in and those are due next Thursday, September 6th, which is very a very important date. Uh, that deadline was originally August 17, but then when they proposed increasing the tariff rate from 10 to 25%, that deadline was extended. So presumably there's gonna be a lot of comments filed given the sheer number of listed subheadings and goods captured and there's already over 2,000 comments and USTR is gonna at least have to give those a cursory look and see what can be paired off. So we're anticipating an effective date sometime in October since the White House wants to have these in place by midterms, which are of course a couple months away. So lastly, regarding the possibility of a fourth list, uh, we've heard rumors that one is out there Unfortunately, we can't comment on uh, details just yet, but we just want to note that rumors are circulating and presumably that may tear up the remaining $255 billion in imports from China. So with this slide, I just want to go through some of the delisting and exclusion criteria. Um, so on the first point, there is something actually of Chinese origin. So suppose you have a Korean raw material it you know, goes to China for processing and do an intermediate and then gets sent to the U.S. So previously, before the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement, it, it didn't matter whether that product was declared to be of Korea origin or Chinese origin. It, it affected the way it, it was marked and other things like that, but it, it didn't really have many implications for the U.S. company importing in that the duty rate would be the same. So with these multi-country manufacturing processes, it's, it's tricky, and Customs uses a standard called substantial transformation meaning uh, that the country of origin is the last place where a substantial transformation took place. It's, it's a tricky standard and customs, rulies, customs rulings vary here. Um, so for example, you take an active ingredient in an ibuprofen tablet, you get it from Korea to China, formulate it in China, you, you know, mix it with excipients and starch and press the tablet. Well, CPB may say that its country of origin is wherever that active ingredient came from, and that the transformation wasn't substantial enough. And unless there's a free trade agreement or GSP says otherwise, that's that. So if there's no free trade agreement, it's substantial transformation. If there is a free trade agreement or GSP in place, it's, it's whatever rule uh, is in that agreement. So this analysis can be very product specific, obviously, and very tricky. So once past that initial step of concluding it's Chinese, the next step is whether it's available domestically or in third countries. And this is where we see most of the analysis being done and what most of the testimony and comments are focusing on now. We've come to know that despite some of the rhetoric, the goal here is actually not to repatriate jobs. The goal is to find pressure points and get Beijing to make concessions on the IP front. So in addition to being able to argue that a product isn't available in the, in the US, in order for things to succeed, you, you have to be able to do that to argue that it's also not available in third countries, which fortunately, especially chemical manufacturers can often do. So we'll note here that everyone should uh, probably steer clear of the whole tariff number shopping thing and formulation in other countries and whatnot. After all, I, I wouldn't wish a customs audit on my worst enemy. So we just want to make note of that here. Moving on now, what does it mean to be available? So there's really no clear precedent for it. So we're at least framing it in commercial terms, saying things like given safety requirements, qualification requirements, and so on. It can be done in a commercially reasonable period of time. So that's another one of these issues that is gonna to have to be fleshed out. Moving on down the list, one of the other factors that USTR has explicitly said they're going to consider is whether the product featured in the uh, Made in China 2025 initiative, which I'll uh, touch more on shortly. Uh, the impact on the impact on the company. Um, it's one thing if tariffs, you know, marginally affect the bottom line, but it's another thing when tariffs are going to shut down factories and plants and result in layoffs. So loss of jobs increases the likelihood that a that an exclusion request is going to be granted. Uh, moving along, what is the definition of a product? The Federal Register notice on the exclusion process says USTR won't define products by commercial idea or brand. So apparently when describing products, you have to provide a full description, not just the brand name. So when this becomes relevant, just be very clear what chemical 
and physical characteristics of the product are. And then finally, um, duty suspension status. So if a product was accepted by the ITC as a duty suspension candidate, it's an official recognition that the U.S. economy is strengthened by duty-free entry of that particular item, and basically that there's no harm to U.S. manufacturers. So uh, Made in China 2025, one of the reasons we're here in the first place. So this is China's state finance initiative to comprehensively upgrade Chinese industry. So although the, the goal is to upgrade industry writ large, uh, the plan highlights 10 priority sectors, um, new advanced information tech, automated machine tools and robotics, aerospace and aeronautical equipment, marine time equipment and high-tech shipping, modern rail transport equipment, new energy vehicles and equipment, power equipment, ag equipment, new materials, and probably most importantly for our purposes, biopharma and advanced uh, medical products. So basically, I mean, negotiating made in China 2025 is complicated. So the, previously, the Trump administration has called for Beijing to halt all subsidies to industries in the program, including low-cost loans from state-owned banks um, and also accept that the U.S. will have some tariffs on these industries for reasons of national security uh, and cyber espionage and that uh, stealing commercial secrets and stop demanding that American companies share key technologies with Chinese companies. So while China may not be willing to go that far, it could offer some concessions that might provide an ostensible victory. Um, China has actually expressed willingness to change parts of its industrial policy that violate global trade rules, but China's program falls into some gray areas. So while the World Trade Organization has a lot of rules to prevent governments from subsidizing companies directly, the rules are pretty vague on whether a state-run banking system can actually provide preferential loans. So these loans have been the core of the Chinese industrial policy for a long time and continue to be under Maine China 2025. So China has begun exploring ways for Maine China 2025 to finance more R&D instead of paying for the immediate construction of a lot of factories and uh, the WTO rules allow for research subsidies. So on the third point, would delisting chemicals impede China's Maine 2025 policy, which is what the administration is trying to do? And the answer is yes, uh, emphatically. So for years, the People's Republic of China has been incentivizing manufacturers, incentivizing manufacturers in China to move up this value chain. Uh, many products in the past have had export subsidies, um, and products low on the value chain lost these subsidies years ago. So this was done years before the 2025 plan, or at least it was the first step of 2025. So by putting tariffs on the raw materials or intermediates coming into the USA, the administration is actually aiding the Chinese plan for 2025. This increase in tariffs will uh, in increase the cost of manufacturing these higher value products in the U.S. and make them just less competitive globally. Or if the U.S. is the only manufacturer, then it's going to make these markets more attractive for entry. So this is going to open up the door for Chinese companies to move into those markets. The capital cost for Manufacturing these higher value products is higher than the lower chain, the lower value chain products. Um, it stands reason that if the global market has higher pricing, it's easier to attract investments into these projects. Uh, by keeping the status quo, we keep domestic manufacturing competitive on the global market and don't incentivize others to enter these high end, uh, technically challenging and more expensive banner markets. So that's our arguments we made the USTR, which we think is very important in getting this delisted. So SOCMA comments and comments in general. Comments are due next Thursday, September 6th. This is, again, a very important date. So moving on to the data sheet. So SOCMA has provided a data sheet to members, which allows members to basically fill out, include their lines, where you cross-reference the items you import from China against the list, in this case, list three, and then you include the justifications for delisting, and then you send that back to SOCMA. So these data sheets facilitate the combination of metrics so that SOCMA and submitting comments can paint the fuller picture to USTR. For example, if multiple small or medium-sized companies have to import the same substance that is only available in China, 
USTR then has a better idea of the potential job loss and catastrophe. And, and again, this is really where a trade group the size of SOCMA really comes in handy, uh, being that we're able to specialize and get detailed and kind of combine these metrics without disclosing CBI to the public or competitors. So essentially, SOCMA comments are going to detail hundreds of individual product lines and whether or not alternative sources exist, which uh, members have submitted to me already. So I think that. Uh, lastly, here are the template for SOCMA members' individual comments. So there are procedures for protecting CBI, and individual comments are going to, um, you know, it'll allow companies to be better able to touch on things like how much your company exports to China, and say the retaliatory tariffs are going to have a huge impact on your bottom line, which just adds to that cum cumulative burden. Which, if any SOCMA members would like that template, uh, just shoot me a note, and I'd be happy to walk you through these submission procedures on regulations.gov. Okay, so China's retaliatory list. So, list one chemical. Chemicals were delisted, no need to worry about that. Um, on point one here, members should still check China's retaliatory list too. So as per usual, Beijing implemented its list to immediately following the US last week on August 23rd. China's second list aims at large volume items like polyethylene and acrylonitrile. So this is mainly a, a concern for US petrochemical producers, but just in case there are any petro companies on the line, I'll note that there were changes in China's list too. So initially, China's list included three grades of US origin polyethylene, low density, linear low density, and high density, but uh, LDPE was later not on this revised list of tariffs that was implemented last week. So this revised list also dropped polyvinyl chloride, a resin used to make construction materials like flooring, vinyl siding, and pipes, uh, but it's still targets ethylene dichloride, gasoline, propane, crude oil, and diesel. Not that most of you need to worry about that, but I just wanted to note that in case there are any uh, folks in the petro value chain uh, on this call that China's list too was in fact revised. So now that China list three is actually, okay, so China's list three is actually four lists worth 60 billion. Um, under the plan, China would impose tariffs between five and 25% on nearly all of the 130 billion in goods imported from the US. It actually bumped it up to 110 billion, but so China's Ministry of Finance said the new tariffs would target more than 5,200 types of goods, including energy exports like biodiesel and liquefied natural gas and some more of these US ag products like uh, honey and lamb. But chemicals would take a big hit to almost 1,000 American chemicals and plastic products. This is almost one fifth of Beijing's latest list uh, would face Chinese tariffs. So this is the retaliatory list or lists that we are most concerned with, at least four. So also with the Chinese crackdown on chemical companies that do not meet these safety and environmental standards, some segment member sales into Asia and China are the best they've seen in years. Um, you know, everyone's working to grow relationships with these companies based on quality service reasonable pricing, so these tariffs, if these retaliatory tariffs, if it implemented, really squander those opportunities and create a logistical nightmare. I, I think we all know China is strong in ag supplying, um, so these inspections, uh, these safety, these environmental inspection, inspections which started in 2016, have really impacted the global ag supply. After all, China has a 2020 goal to have 30% less ag plants than in 2016. And they're doing this by shutting down plants and uh, more waste discharge equals more taxes. So um, lastly, hold on impact. Um, the point three note impact of retaliatory tariffs and individual comments. This is um, better suited for individual comments as opposed to SOCMA comments. We'll be of course touching on the retaliatory tariffs at a high level, but um, when you're filling out individual comments, definitely note that. And I can, of course, help assist members with some of that analysis. Conclusion, um, realign business to different competitive environments. So here, firms 
firms want to understand the impact on their specific business and bottom line. This impact can be much higher than the overall welfare effect, obviously, and it can go even go in the opposite direction. And it can be more affected by the nature of, say, non-tariff rules and regulations that govern the way in which a foreign market can be accessed through uh, investment and trade. The ultimate impact on firms is going to depend on the industry's market structure, um, the profile of a firm's rivals, its own value chain footprint, and then a full range of policy tools applied. So let's not stop at calculating the impact of the tariff on your bottom line. Um, there's a need to move forward toward a full analysis of how your strategy might need to change. Uh, these long-term trends depend on whether or not your firms change their behavior. And that is uh, an important point for firms that the key decision facing companies is how to realign their business to a different competitive environment. Point two, resolution this fall possibly, but don't count on it. So the U.S. and China finished two days of trade talks last week with no sign of an end to the escalating trade war. Both sides will remain in contact for the next arrangement. President Trump has also been vague about whether he's going to meet one-on-one -on -one with Chinese President Xi Jinping in November when both leaders are expected to attend the APEC, East Asia, and G20 summits. Uh, Trump added he had no particular time frame for resolving the trade conflict. Uh, Brussels also hopes that the G20 in Argentina will be a decisive moment for the U.S. to get together with Japan and the EU and uh, reach terms on a joint legal proposal on forming the WTO subsidy rules, which could then maybe be presented to China and some other members. So things to look out for there. On point three, here, companies need a corporate policy on what invoicing is going to look like after you start seeing these tariffs. So the question is, what does an invoice to a customer look like the day after you pay tariffs? Then say in six to 10 months from that point, your company finds out that the 25% Chinese surcharge tariff has been rescinded. Now your company is going to get a check back from the government, but your customers uh, will know that you got that check back and will probably be looking for some of their money back. Uh, this means a lot of suppliers are going to have to make some tough decisions on how they market their products covered by these tariffs. So how you prepare yourself for refunds in this ill-defined uh, period of time, you know, it could be, say, a year from now. It's, it's going to be important. So consumers won't see these refunds, but the industrial world will. And it's useful to start thinking in these kinds of terms right now. In general though, uh, firms essentially need to boost their analytical capacity to prepare themselves to assess for a more uncertain environment ahead and prepare their responses in a fact-driven way. If, and if you don't have adequate staffing with spare time to do so, use Sockman, use these resources that we provide. Uh, for the non-members on this call, join Sockman. We're pretty. We're doing some pretty cutting edge things these days on multiple fronts, including tariffs. And if you already are a member, please continue to engage. We really appreciate that. I've got some terrific data points and feedback for list three comments so far, and we're going to continue to build off this information sharing in combination of metrics and more fully capture this disproportionate burden that list three would place on various specialty chemical industry sectors. Okay, so we wanted to leave some time for questions, um, and if we don't get to them all, I'll try and follow up with submitters in the coming days and get those answered. But just a, a reminder to those on the line um, and on the GoToMeeting platform, you can submit your questions to us using the Q&A feature on your screen. Uh, we'll take questions from there and read them out over the phone so everyone can hear those questions and answers. So at this point, a uh, big thanks again to Jim DeLacy, chairman of our ITC and uh, president of Fanwood Chemical for being on the line to answer questions. Uh, now, Jim, at this point, are there some questions in the queue that you can share some insights on? Uh, I haven't seen questions, Matt. Have you seen questions? Um, let's see here. Let me pull up the chat function. Bear with us, folks, just one minute. 
Well, Matt, well, Matt's looking. Um, I'd like to mention that uh, any of you that are going to uh, Specialty in Agrochemicals America next week, uh, I will be doing a brief presentation on this subject on uh, Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock before the showcases start. Uh, and there's an international trade meeting on Friday. Uh, so if you've got other questions and, and details, you can you can find me or I know some of the, uh, I'm not sure if Matt's gonna be in Charleston next week, but I know uh, Robbie will be there. So find one of us and, and uh, pester us with questions and we'll try to help. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I'll be in Charleston too, uh, Thursday and Friday. Okay, terrific, good. Um, just one, bear with us for one more moment here, folks. We're gonna get on this, uh, another computer and see if we can't find these questions. Frankly, Matt, you did such a good job explaining that maybe there are no questions. <laughs> and if, you know, if it turns out we are and we're doing something wrong here with the GoToWebinar, we can follow up with those who ask questions afterward. Yeah, if you send us a, uh, an email or, or give us a call, we'll help in any way we can. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, okay, so. Jim, Matt, this is uh, Robbie. Um, I do have a couple of questions, actually. Um, if MTB is signed into law, is there a possibility that we could have tariff relief, but still have a 25% duty on the same imported product? Yes, absolutely. The, uh, these 25% tariffs are, are should be considered a surcharge um, so that you may get some relief um, if the MTB, hopefully um, the house comes back uh, Tuesday, and so hopefully the House will take up the Senate passed bill shortly thereafter, and so you could have an MTB sometime uh, late October, early November, uh, which would take away some of the sting of the 25%, but it's, but obviously not all of it. So um, yes, you could have 25% tariffs on materials that are otherwise duty free, and that's one of the reasons we made the point in one of those in one of the slides that if you are writing to request exemptions. Um, you've got ITC, if, and, and the product is subject to an MP, MTB, you've got an ITC certification that the materials required uh, for U.S. Um, uh, consumption, and it, it's it, purchasing it from overseas does not impact the U.S. producer. Thanks, Jim. Um, again, Jim or Matt, are there any updates on how the, the public comment process is proceeding, you know, the volume and type of comments? Well, one thing that was clear, and, and we can send a list, they originally planned, I believe, three days of hearings, and then and hearings got extended to six days, uh, and they were six full days, so that the, uh, the number of people that felt that this was important enough to buy tickets in hotel rooms in Washington uh, was quite large, um, and uh, I think, as Matt said, one of the, one of the bullets there was a huge number of people that that wrote into the docket and you've still got until september 6th to write to the docket so it's going to take um ustr quite a while to weed through all of the responses that they got uh which may which may slow this process down a little bit because ustr is not a large organization and as many of you may have seen um they're really celebrating the the uh the completion of a revised uh, NAFTA, U.S.-Mexico free trade agreement, and they're working on Canada. So uh, they're doing an awful lot right now. So it's hard to imagine how they've got the bandwidth to get all this done in a reasonable period of time. OK, we've got a couple more here, and they keep rolling in. Um, is it reasonable to expect a refund from the government if they rescind or delist material? Absolutely. That's. Uh, They've, uh, at least in the case of the first crunch, which is the only place where we actually have uh, a detailed um, uh, federal register notice on how to, how, to, how to ask for exemptions, it explicitly says the money will be refunded back to the first day the duties were collected. So yes, if, if you are successful in, uh, in getting your product exempted, uh, you can, ex as, 
as long as the procedures are similar to they as as was published for tranche one, which is what's expected, uh, you will you will you can expect to get a refund. Which frankly is what's makes the invoicing issue more more difficult because mm -hmm. that refund will uh, will not be uh, a secret, uh, and it's likely your customers will find out you got it. Okay, and along the same lines as, as uh, sort of timing, if an order is placed and it's being shipped to the United States prior to implementation of the tariff, but while in transit, tariffs are implemented. You no, know, we just. Met, yeah, we were the same as that, sir. The, the tariffs will be collected as of the as of the date of arrival in the United States. So please don't think you can put material in transit to avoid the tariffs. That won't work. And folks, we're getting some back, background noise on the line here, so if you could mute your lines, we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, just just because there was some background noise, just to be very specific, the, the, the date, the important date is the date of importation, not the date of, the, of export. So if the material arrives in the U.S. after the date that these tariffs come into effect, regardless of how long it's been in transit, the tariffs will be collected. Thanks, Jim. Um, and are the tariffs 10% or 25%? It seems like there's some confusion. That's uh, That was one of the things that they asked for comments on uh, because originally they were posted at 10% and then they revised it uh, that it would likely go to 25%, but I do not believe a final decision on that's been made. It's likely to be 25%, but that could change. Yeah, Jim, and I'll just say, uh, I've read uh, it was increased to 25. One of the reasons that happened was because of um, maybe some suspected currency manipulation. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, the administration wasn't happy with that. So maybe terms can be reached similar to what happened with South Korea early this year, like a side deal, anti-devaluation type thing. Uh, maybe that might get it to 10%, but I think we're operating as if it's going to be 25. Again, it's, folks, if you mute your lines, we appreciate it. It's important that everybody understand that there is some speculation in here until the uh, – Federal Register notice is published sometime really? likely uh, around 15 September or the week of the 17th to officially lay all this out. There is there is speculation in this in this presentation. And gentlemen, is there any indication that this uh, that list three will actually be reduced and that products will come off of it? That's uh, in, in the case of list one, a substantial number of products were removed. In the case of list two, <clears throat> only four or five were. Uh, it's, it would be pure speculation <clears throat> to guess at, 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 the, at the outcome of list three. Thanks, Jim. Um, so we'll see if Robbie comes back with any more questions, but and folks, we apologize for the background noise and the muting issues and the, and the trouble submitting questions. But as a reminder, we'll be sending a link to this recording and a follow-up email to all uh, attendees and the registrants. And uh, feel free to email additional questions offline. We'll, of course, follow up with all those. Uh, but other than that, we, we want to thank everyone for tuning in. And thank you to Jim DeLacy for sharing insights on these increasingly important questions. And uh, is one final reminder, list three comments are due next Thursday, September 6th. Uh, many SOCMA members have already submitted tariff codes and justifications uh, for delisting, but we can always use more information if you have it. Uh, a lot of people on this call are much more well-versed in the technical details um, of why various chemistries are, you know, only available from certain suppliers. So we always appreciate those. and. Love to use them as the backbone of our arguments. And Matt and Jim, we had um, one more sneak in uh, just in time. So just one more question for you guys. Um, <clears throat> if a company purchases chemicals from U.S. distributors that are not directly from China, however, those distributors purchase chemicals from China, how should the uh, how should our company respond? I would respond as if you were the direct importer uh, because distributors um, 
they're going to have to they're going to have to collect that tariff. Uh, so I would suggest that you respond as if you were a direct importer and you urge your distributor uh, to also respond uh, for, for on his own behalf so that there really should be two responses on that. And you need to keep careful track of your distributor to make sure that uh, you are alerted if, if, you're, if the request is successful um, uh, so that you get your money back. Thanks, Jim. Um, the last question that just rolled in here was a uh, basic question of when will this be posted online, and we will we'll have it posted online as soon as we can, uh, you know, get it recorded and get it uh, get it down and get a link to it on the Stockholm website. Yep, ASAP, definitely this week. Um, no more questions. That's wait, it. I just I just, wait. I just got a very interesting question that was emailed to me, and I will respond back to this person. Um, and the issue is, I thought if the MTB passed that we would port under a new HS code, which is a 99 code, these aren't on list three, are they? He's correct. They are not on list three, but imports under the MTB have to reference both numbers. The normal uh, HTS number that's assigned to the product and then the 9900 code so that the... Um, Imports under the MTB for this purpose will be classified in their normal place. So that the, the, the 9900 number that's associated with the MTB uh, is, is just a separate benefit, but would not, Im would not impact this process. Okay, thank you, Jim. So... In conclusion, so for those of you who have submitted information to me through the aforementioned data sheet, um, I'll be sending out a draft of SOCMA comments here soon, hopefully by Friday. So please look for that and give edits and suggestions. And uh, lastly, I know the companies have CBI concerns. And I just want to reiterate that company names are not going to be used. And I'm definitely going to be erring on the side of not using any information that would even remotely tie a manufacturer to a certain product. Uh, or distributor, for that matter. But, um, and, and that's why it is best to file individual comments on behalf of your own company, uh, whereby submitters can disclose CBI to USTR without that info being publicly available. And again, this can be done through SOGMA's comment template, uh, which I can circulate to any member that hasn't already received it and is interested. Um, but uh, uh, lastly, lastly, SOGMA is going to be Featured in an upcoming Chemical Week webinar on Wednesday, September 12th at 11 a.m., where myself and Robert Helminiak, Sockman's VP of Legal and Government Relations, are going to be presenting slides and commentary uh, in a similar fashion to today's presentation. But for more information on Sockman advocacy efforts or anything we've discussed today or maybe didn't get to, please don't hesitate to reach out offline. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that everyone has a good holiday weekend. Take care.